Good evening. Uh, a very warm welcome on behalf of the ESU and the Leakshire branch to this very special event. And you've seen a little bit of what the English speaking union does um, in a rather nice little video. I'd just like to stress a couple of things about it. It helps young people all over the world. And the task and the interest of the ESU is in helping them to learn how to communicate. Debating is a very important part of this, but it's not the be all and end all. And we do an awful lot of work in the deprived communities around the world, just teaching them how to speak, how to communicate. But given the COVID restrictions that uh, we've all had for so long now, we've been beaming virtual events, talks, conferences to members for quite some time. But following conversations with Mike McKenzie about the Air Transport Auxiliary, it was clear to us that the opportunity to share the story of the ATA with a much wider audience was an enormous opportunity. And that wider audience is with us tonight. So hence a very special welcome to the Air Transport Auxiliary Association, and of course to the ESU members as well. And it's on the day in which we commemorate the disbandment of the unique wartime organization on the 30th of November, 1945. Now we, we've got a host of guests from overseas, from parts of the United States, from Canada, Belgium, France, Germany, Kenya, South Africa, Australia, Singapore, and the Philippines. And I'm not sure whether that last collection will be awake, but if they're not, they will get a recording and that recording will be sent out to you in due course. We've got defense attaches from London, uh, from America, Canada, Australia, and Thailand. But I'd like to single out one of our guests, very special guest from Canada, watching us and shortly to be with you, Mrs. J. Edwards, formerly third officer Peterson of the Air Transport Auxiliary. And how wonderful that she can be with us tonight at 102 years young. And with luck, you'll be seeing her very shortly. Jay, are you there? Yes, I am. Jay, it's, I hope everybody can see Jay, um, but how wonderful it is. I've got a question for you because you'd be kind enough to not only be seen by people, but hopefully you can say a few words. What is your fondest memory of the ATA? Being able to take off a plane that was not mine up into a beautiful blue sky uh, with the sun shining and know exactly where I was going. Our maps did not give names to any place. Uh, everything was just um, pencil or ink pen penned in because we were not allowed to have names, any names of stations uh, around Britain. I think that covers our biggest um, difficulty, but you went to Met to get the information so that you could ma dot, make a dot where you were going when you received your chit to get going in the morning. We did not have to fly if the weather was not too suitable, but we, and we were given the chance to make the decision as to whether it was flyable or not. It was seldom that you didn't fly, but there were occasions on which the English weather did not co cooperate very well. Um, but we it always made the opportunity to go if we could. One exciting trip was when we went to Yeovil, everyone picked up a seafarer uh, and the juniors had to fly to the uh, uh, north till they came to the narrowest piece of water between Northern Ireland and England and were then allowed to fly across the water to land and those planes were going directly onto uh, oh, a ship that was going to Malta. So that was a big thrill. Every plane was an enjoyment. 
but that was a thrill. Thank you. Hey, it's so lovely that you're able to join us tonight and thank you for sharing that, that memory with us. And uh, I hope you're going to enjoy what's coming. The ATA is a Me? quite remarkable organization. It's legendary in the Royal Air Force and in the Fleet Air Arm. And of course they were united in their love of flying and their belief in freedom. And as you'll hear, literally thousands of aircraft were delivered in the, to the front line. And this released the military pilots from the task so that they could go back to the front line. Their training, as you'll hear, was pretty basic, simple. They had pilot's notes, which many pilots thought were the best in the world because they were very small, a couple of pages and everything was on it. If you look at them today, they're volumes, I can assure you. And you flew with a map and a stopwatch and you flew in all weathers. It was hugely challenging. It was pretty dangerous. And in comparison to the training that they get today and the flying aids that they have today, it was a world away. And my admiration for you is just boundless. Now, I recall back in uh, 1992, uh, the Remembrance Sunday, I'd just become head of the Air Force and I marched out with the other chiefs of staff to the Cenotaph. And as we turned into line at the Cenotaph, I noticed a, a, a very slim lady standing next to me. And from what I could see, she was wearing a, a dark uniform. And because I couldn't turn and look at her, I said out of the corner of my mouth, hello, I'm Michael Graydon. And she said, I know. And I'm Diana Bonato Walker. And I suddenly realized who I was standing next to, one of these wonderful ladies from the ATA. And uh, you will have seen this year that the wreath was laid by the current honorary Commodore, Minnie Churchill. Such is his reputation that that still happens. I attended many guest nights at Rory F. Lynham with ATA members. These were all memorable affairs, quite riotous, and I've absolutely no intention of describing in any more detail. But Camilla's given you the short course on asking questions. I hope all of you discovered how to do this on your laptops and your iPads. And at the end, there'll be a short thank you from me for everybody. So do keep some, something suitable to drink for that time because we'd like to give a toast. Now our speaker is John Webster, the ATAA secretary. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Minnie Churchill, the association's Henri Commodore, whose father, as you've heard, uh, was Sir Gerald Delanger, a founder of the ATA. Minnie, how delighted, delightful it is to have you with us. Over to you. It's an enormous pleasure to be here this evening to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the flag down for ATA. I would particularly like to thank Air Chief Marshal Sir Michael Graydon and his team for making all the arrangements for this, this evening and for introducing me and also Michael McKenzie, whose idea it was and has made it possible that he has done everything possible to make it happen. For my part, I'm now going to read the broadcast that my father, Gerard Delanger, made on the BBC immediately after the news on the 16th of September, 1942. He said, it would not be possible for me to attempt to describe the part the ATA plays in this war without impinging on others. And I hope in consequence, giving full measure of credit to many other organizations and services. You see, we, the ATA, although a civilian volunteer organization, are the carriers by air of all aircraft, military, naval and civil, belonging to HM government. On us devolves the transmission of the efforts of millions of one section of the community, the Royal Air Force, the Fleet Air Arm, and the Army Cooperation Command. Many of you have recognized and often been puzzled when you have seen these men and women in their dark blue uniforms with gold rank badges on their shoulders and gold wings with our initials ATA in the center. They number British men and women, American men and women, French men and women, Polish men and women, Czechs and others. These men and women are ferry pilots. ATA officially stands for Air Transport Auxiliary, but I nickname it, by nickname it has many other labels. Ancient and tattered airmen is one. All terrified airmen is another. 
anywhere to anywhere, however, is the description I favor as describing most aptly what our initials stand for, since our job is, with or without notice, promptly to fly any of His Majesty's aircrafts from any point of origin to any destination. We are responsible to the Ministry of Aircraft Production, on whose behalf we are administered by British Airways. The aircraft we ferry originate in the great production factories controlled by MAP. These include the contractors, the shadow factories, and the civilian repair organizations. Also, the repair sections of one of the many unsung sections of the RAF, number 43 group. From these to all commands of the RAF, we deliver aircraft, bomber, fighter training, army cooperation, and to the fleet air arm. On the AID and firms test pilots we rely on for the airworthiness of the craft we are entrusted with, and not often are we let down. The organization we associate most closely with, however, is the 41st group of the Royal Air Force, who store, prepare, and issue all aircraft. They are by far the largest and yet most overlooked Air Force unit. To them and to their personnel, to whom we and the country owe so much, I can but extend grateful praise. I now want to delve a little into the ATA's short but lively history. I was made responsible for the, its formation on the outbreak of war. My terms of reference on the outbreak of war were to collect civilian pilots not eligible for the RAF. We were to fly light aircraft on communication work. Volunteers were abundant, but there was no immediate disruption of peacetime mode of travel. So we weren't wanted until the then small and overstrained Royal Air Force invited the ATA's assistance in ferrying their aircraft. None of us had ever imagined ourselves capable of flying military planes, but we thenceforth did and enjoyed it. The first break thereafter in the humdrum life of being paid for flying a thousand horsepower aircraft when our civilian training for which we paid consisted in flying a hundred horsepower planes came in the Battle of France. Suddenly, without notice, the order of the day was deliveries to the continent as fast as we could, and then as rapidly the evacuation of men and planes to be brought back. This period merged into the Battle of Britain, in which we were privileged to play our part. Every RAF squadron was staffed for deliveries. There were, however, two factors during the period which made our task most difficult. First of all, the squadrons wouldn't stay put and we would fly all over the place looking for them in their latest dispersal. And secondly, there weren't enough aircraft to satisfy their needs. The disappointment of those fighter pilots who had their craft shot away under them at not receiving an immediate replacement was acute. And we knew the supply was running short, but couldn't tell them. It is now known that only six fighter aircraft were finally left in store at the close of the Battle of Britain. Several squadrons were taking the air, only six to seven strong. Fortunately, there were some humorous interludes to this otherwise arduous period. The first of our British pilots without notice delegated on return from Scotland with his aeroplane to go to France, protested for time in which to advise his wife who expected him home for dinner and otherwise might be suspicious. The young but overambitious American pilot, whom we detailed somewhat prematurely through force of circumstances to deliver this first Spitfire to a fighter squadron. He duly delivered it in one piece and subsequently happily dilating in the squadron was on the prowess turned to a veteran fighter pilot for his opinion of Spitfire flying. The retort was apt, there's no future in it. Those were hand-to-mouth days. We have always been expanding, and whilst our main task lies in delivering aircraft within the British Isles, from Land's End to the Orkneys and Shetlands, our pilots have flown aircraft to and from Africa, America, and the Middle East, and urgent aircraft 
for transmission by aircraft carrier to Malta. When you look at the skies, every aircraft you see had been flown or is being flown on a delivery flight by one of our pilots, be it Stirling, Lancaster, Halifax, Fortress or Liberator, Wellington, Whitney, Hudson, Havoc, Typhoon, Spitfire, Hurricane, Oxford, Master Magister or Tiger Moth, etc. A total of 177 different types our pilots have handled. On the 11th of September, five days ago, the ATA celebrated its third birthday and almost to a day its 100,000th delivery, in the process of which, including training hours and transport, or as we call the taxi hour, we have flown a total of 255,480 hours, equivalent to some 30 million miles. This record of which we are proud has only been possible not only by virtue of the unstinting assistance we have received from all with whom we come in contact, but exceedingly by the efforts of our ground staff, operations, engineering, technical, transport drivers, medical, telephonists, administrative and other staff, whom I take this opportunity to mention. And above all, those men and women, ATA pilots, nearly 100, who have lost their lives in the process of delivering aircraft anywhere to anywhere. I now would like to introduce our speaker, John Webster, who is not only the secretary of the ATA Association, but is also the volunteer researcher at the Maidenhead Heritage Centre, where all the archives are kept. He does so much to keep the memory of ATA alive. It's over to you, John. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minnie. I, I think that uh, that your father's words aptly uh, introduced my talk. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, some of those who played a part in ATA's story and feature several ways in which uh, it is currently being remembered. Whilst I appreciate that most of you will know uh, how the ATA was structured and worked, I will be covering a few of the basics, however. Now, we're going to be talking, obviously, about air transport auxiliary remembered. Delanger mentioned, obviously, ancient and tattered airmen. Um, I have another one, which is all types accepted. Uh, both, in fact, uh, apply to several of the people I'll be talking about uh, this evening. Now, the gentleman in this photograph, uh, the two portly gentlemen on the left um, were not really suited to uh, squeezing into a Spitfire and so they spent most of their time in ATA uh, flying the Anson, the Faithful Annie. Um, the two, uh, however, in the middle of the picture, uh, Dougie Fairweather and um, uh, uh, Jim Kempster, they were unfortunately two of ATA's casualties whilst flying with an offshoot of uh, ATA, the air movements flight, a little division within ATA. Uh, the fact that dear uh, Dougie um, Fairweather, second from, from the left there, was renowned for being something of a chain smoker somewhat prohibited within ATA aircraft. And he used to navigate by means of a seven minute cigarette burn. Uh, he also eschewed the use of uh, uh, charts, which uh, the ATA didn't approve of. Jim Kempster on the far right, his, uh, his claim to fame was being able to land a Sterling um, on three points. Quite, uh, quite a, still, a skilled pilot as all four were. Humble beginnings. Now, in order to uh, uh, start the organization, Derlanger set up uh, at uh, White Waltham near Maidenhead in this wooden hut. And as the need required more and more people to uh, uh, fly from further, further afield, uh, he actually um, sent a small uh, party up to Presswick to form the ferry pool up there. And all they could find to uh, uh, 
live in was this uh, battered old bus. The cab turned into the CO's uh, office, a couple of partitions. The next uh, part was the general office and at the rear, the crew room. Now, ATA actually set up um, 16 uh, numbered ferry pools, although they didn't use the number 11 or the number 13. They also had staff deployed at various uh, sites around the country uh, for training purposes and for conversion to flying things like the four-engined aircraft. Now, here we have a rather interesting connection with the RAF because, as I said, the ATA deployed some of its staff around to uh, other units for four-engine conversion. And they had a small body of people at RAF Pocklington up in Yorkshire, uh, which was uh, run by RAF's 41 group. And its CO, uh, the ATA CO, Captain, uh, Flight Captain Henderson, actually became base commander for a period of six months in 1943 because its uh, RAF commander was uh, uh, posted elsewhere. Uh, now, I believe, having found this photograph, I believe that uh, uh, Flight Captain Henderson is the chap in the darker uniform in the front row, third from the left. After the wooden hut at, at uh, White Waltham, we ended up with a purpose-built uh, headquarters building on the opposite end of the big hangar from the wooden hut. And beside it, the officers could take tea on the terrace. The crockery was even emblazoned with the ATA logo. Now, you probably know that uh, ATA uh, flew a vast array of aircraft. And in order to cope with that, the skillful uh, engineering department devised a system of splitting all the types into just six classes. And the pilots were then to qualify in each of those classes, provided they were uh, uh, suitably uh, uh, skillful to do so. And having proved themselves capable of flying just one representative type in that class, they were then cleared to fly all manner of aircraft within that particular class. Also, ATA needed to move its pilots to where they were required, and it started off with uh, some impressed aircraft, civilian aircraft impressed by the military. One of those was actually owned by, uh, or previously owned, by one of ATA's female pilots, and uh, she, ATA Commander Marion Wilberforce um, was given a receipt for this aircraft in which it said condition good. She crossed that out and wrote excellent. However, the eventual fleet that uh, ATA ended up with to move its pilots around with was the American, uh, like the American Fairchild Argus up at the top there, four seats, or Faithful Annie, the Avro Anson, nine or ten seater. As the need arose for more and more pilots, um, originally ATA was uh, recruiting those qualified to fly and need for more pilots and type conversions, refresher flying and so on, saw the establishment of a very comprehensive training regime. And thus potential pilots were then recruited, given 110 hours basic ab initio training before pool attachment. Uh, for experience in a Fairchild taxi aircraft prior to training for class two conversion, which meant nearly 20 hours on Harvard, pictured bottom right, uh, one hour on a hurricane, after which they were on their own, given access to everything in class two. Bear in mind, there were no two seat Spitfires then, of course. Mentioned uh, previously was uh, the fact that ATA had these uh, wonderful ferry pilots notes and people tend to think that that's all they had. But back in the uh, ferry pools, they had a set of uh, particularly comprehensive uh, ferry pilots notes or handling notes, which in fact were rather 
many of the RAF pilots were a bit envious of uh, ATA's ability to create such, uh, such notes. There was, however, uh, a note on one of these that always caught my eye in relation to the Beaufort twin-engined uh, fighter bomber. And it read, the Beaufort will fly on one engine, but does need very firm handling. Very sadly, only two disastrously discovered by at least one of ATA's casualties. Now, in order to cope with some of the larger aircraft, particularly the four engined uh, bombers, uh, you really needed a flight engineer to handle the management of engines and fuel systems and so on. And this is a group uh, of, of smiling flight engineers at White Waltham, 1943. And the gentleman in the back row with the halo is in fact, Freddie Laker, who obviously went on to form Laker Airways amongst other uh, involvement in civil aviation post-war. Now, it's often said that ATA was something of an equal opportunity employer. Remember my all types accepted. Well, on the left here, we have Stuart Keith Jopp, who was uh, a Royal Flying Corps pilot. And after <clears throat> uh, succumbing to a grenade uh, accident, he was left minus one arm and minus one eye. His colleague on the right, the Honourable Charles Dutton, later Lord Sherborne, was in fact uh, also uh, missing the whole of his right arm. I'm going to show you um, uh, an extract from one of my uh, interviews on behalf of the Maidenhead Heritage Centre. This gentleman was a flight engineer and bearing in mind the disability mentioned, we're talking now about an American pilot recruited who had a very pronounced stutter. And this is uh, our flight engineer, Paul Longthorpe, talking about how he managed to uh, cope with such. To fly with American pilots, they, they anglicise themselves so rapidly. Milton B. Hill, for instance, said to me, God damn it, man, he said, when I was in America, I said, I used to think, uh, you can't fly in airplanes in England. You take off, you open the throttle at Land's End and you pass London before you get airborne. <laughs> he said, I was quite surprised to see how big it was. But since he had a, a stutter, he did, 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 uh, he never, he, oh no, never uh, said it that way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not pulling his leg. <laughs> he was a wonderful pilot. He, in fact, he would, if he wanted zero boost, he would join his thumb and forefinger like that and say, instead of saying, well, I could have got, like, they had the carriage up and yes. put the fire out until he got it out. If he got zero or like that, making sure he's done like that, it was like no, that, quite, quite. Two, uh, plus two or whatever it would be. Uh -huh. And uh, for a gear down, that was thumbs down. Uh -huh. But 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 and his foot used to jangle like that on the on the runabout. You could hear go clatter clatter clatter, and people used to say, "Well, how the hell do you fly with him?" And the answer was easy because he let me do it all myself. You know, he would just go peep peep peep. That's why he wanted paper. And he want the map, and he would lie fly with the the map on his lap, and and his clip his watch stopwatch. And he'd be looking at the map flying there, but that might have been going through a brick wall. He'd look at his map, that brick, it's not on this map, and boom, he goes through a brick wall. That was the way he flew. <laughs> and a lot of people said, God, I, I wouldn't fly with him because of his stamina. And I said, Well, I'm thankful very much to you guys, and I wanted to leave my pilot alone because he can fly any of these airplanes, and with him, I have to go. <laughs> and therefore, I get what I want. And then, mm hmm. <laughs> ATA, in addition to being an equal opportunities employer, was also uh, quite legitimately uh, could be regarded as a foreign legion of the air. And here we have two gentlemen. On the left, we have uh, Jose Maria Carreras uh, from Spain, who was a very uh, experienced airline pilot for about 6,000 hours before he joined uh, ATA. Uh, he was also qualified on uh, amphibians and became uh, not only uh, ATA's 
um, first one to fly the Liberator, but also uh, the Catalina amphibian and became a training officer under PTA's uh, uh, system of training for, um, for that particular amphibian. On the right, the gentleman with the somewhat difficult name for us uh, uh, Brits um, became known for perhaps obvious reasons as Double Whiskey. He was joined by two other colleagues from uh, Poland who in turn were Whiskey and Triple Whiskey. He too was a very experienced pilot before joining uh, ATA. Now, Philip Wills and his uh, operations staff had the task of uh, receiving calls from 41 Group saying what they wanted moved where. Uh, he would then uh, determine who he had class qualified and available to do that. They would produce chits and sort of ferry chits and telling the pilot what uh, they were required to do. Pilots came to collect that and then went off to the Met office to check the Met. Here we have um, a group at the Belfast uh, ferry pool. And up till now, uh, ATA's air crew were all male. And although there are two women in this photograph sitting in the front row either end in uniform, they are not pilots, they are MT drivers. And also pictured here, we've got two teenagers. One on the left is an ATC cadet, one on the right, a C cadet. And these youngsters were actually employed and paid by ATA. And one survivor living down in Taunton uh, was recruited into the Belfast pool. And he, as a 16 year old, got his hands uh, in the air uh, on the controls of a Sunderland flying boat, a massive Sunderland flying boat, a uh, Catalina amphibian, and a four-engined short Stirling bomber. I don't think they let him land it, though. Now, brace yourselves, ladies. This is the general attitude that prevailed at the time. Trouble is that so many women are insisting on wanting to do jobs, which they are quite incapable of doing, the menace is the woman who thinks she ought to be flying a high-speed bomber when she really has not the intelligence to scrub the floor of a hospital properly, or who wants to nose around as an air raid warden and yet can't cook her husband's dinner. Now, dear C.G. Gray, I'm no, ex uh, I'm no apologist for this gentleman who respected editor of uh, an equally respected magazine. Um, I am reliably informed, however, that uh, a little later he had the heart, uh, the good, good uh, heart to, to actually admit that actually they're doing quite a good job, really. So without this lovely woman, ATA would probably have continued to be an all male organization. And I stress, that the ATA, in fact, uh, the, the, the women recruits were significantly outnumbered by their men. Uh, now, Pauline had been uh, a very uh, experienced flyer during the war, uh, interwar period. And she approached the powers that be with the idea that there were equally qualified women around who could do just as well as the men in ATA. Uh, she was rather begrudgingly uh, told that, okay, go away, give us, give us 12. Came back with their names. Oh, we didn't really want more than eight. So she had to go away and tell four of them to uh, hang fire and get you in later. But uh, that was the attitude that prevailed at the time. So eight were recruited. Here we have the first eight women uh, lined up at Hatfield. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that Hatfield was not one of the numbered uh, ferry pools because the attitude at the time was that they didn't really uh, want, the men didn't really want women on their station. In fact, one commanding officer, O.P. Jones, a very well-known airline pilot, had become commanding officer at Whitchurch 
and he is quoted as having said, on no account am I having women on my station. So the ladies had to set themselves up at uh, Hatfield uh, and that little all women group uh, actually grew and grew until such times as they were beginning to be deployed around the country. And where were they then most useful? At Hamble and at Cosford, two stations that were in the centers of Spitfire production. And the ladies were proving themselves particularly adept at flying that aircraft. And although there were men originally at those two ferry pools, the ladies eventually took over and they became totally uh, female pilot or female air crew stations. Now, American Jackie Cochran, a well-known aviatrix uh, in the States, was a bit frustrated not being allowed to uh, uh, get involved with the military over there, saw what was happening in the UK, uh, came over uh, and managed to recruit another 25 also experienced uh, American females, uh, but unfortunately, uh, Jackie didn't really endear herself to uh, uh, the people over here who were in some cases slumming it in, in digs because um, she uh, booked into the Savoy and was chauffeured out to White Waltham every day. Um, however, she was recalled back to the States. They probably realized they were missing a trick that someone's talented. And she eventually went on to form an organization called the Women Air Service Pilots, the WASPs, uh, which was an all women organization, unlike the ATA. Uh, and they managed to perform uh, a number of very similar tasks, but also as the organization was considerably larger than uh, uh, ATA, um, they got involved in um, uh, ferrying, uh, or, or I should say, a, a multitude of different tasks other than uh, what ATA was used to. Now I'm going to show you a little Pathé newsreel clip, um, and I ask you to pay particular attention at what uh, Pauline Gower is wearing to climb into the airspeed Oxford, as you see her back uh, uh, disappearing into the aircraft, and also the comment about the men. The delivery of new aircraft from factories to operational centers is the responsibility of a vast organization known as the Air Transport Auxiliary, with men of 14 different nationalities in its ranks. Many of the ferry pilots hail from America and the Dominions, and also helping in this important work are several women. We take the four machines that are going up to Scotland, I think we're going to go by the East Coast route, and uh, when you get there, don't forget to uh, send your signals, and then we'll come and collect you by Anson tomorrow morning. The daily delivery of operational aircraft is only a man's job. Training machines and other less powerful planes are piloted by the women, and it's a job they're doing exceedingly well. I, I stop that there because it, it goes on to talk about uh, Churchill visiting another base. Um, you notice that um, Pauline Gower climbing into that Oxford was wearing a skirt. Not very practical, uh, might not be quite so bad climbing into something like that, but uh, uh, having to clamber into a Spitfire or um, a swordfish or something of that kind, the women uh, campaign to be allowed to uh, wear trousers, but I'm reliably informed that on the door of one of the RAF messes, there was a notice which read, all ladies must remove their trousers before entering the mess. I'm not sure whether anyone actually took them up literally on that. Flight Captain Joan Hughes, one of the, or she was in fact, the youngest of that first eight. She learned to fly or started to fly at the age of 15. and was only 21 when she joined ATA. Uh, she was one of only 11 of the women who got to fly four-engined uh, bombers. And she's here uh, with uh, flight engineer Gardner, who um, uh, was in fact uh, a former first officer pilot, in addition to being a flight engineer. You may have seen unknown 
Joan doing some flying because she went on to post-war to fly uh, for a number of film companies and feature films. And if you've seen the film, those magnificent men in their flying machines, the little demoiselle replica, which was supposedly being flown by a rather randy Frenchman, um, would not get off the ground with a man sitting at the controls. So Joan did all the flying dressed as the randy Frenchman. Just a few facts about the, uh, uh, about the women. Notice, however, again, I emphasize the fact that they were outnumbered by their male counterparts, 1246 air crew, but only 168 female. Very notable, though, of those, four were actually flight engineers, very rare occupation for, for a woman at that time, even today, probably. And sadly, of the 168, 17 lost their lives in ETA service. But they did succeed. It took them a few, uh, a few months, uh, June 1943, they actually gained equal pay with the men. Um, but I can't imagine that that uh, privilege was uh, uh, actually enjoyed by the ground staff, which had been mentioned by uh, uh, Sir Michael. Um, or rather um, Delanger, as you can see, a whole load of, of other uh, roles on the ground performed by the ladies. Now, Amy Johnson was uh, eventually persuaded to join ATA. Um, she was tasked not very long, really, after being uh, recruited uh, with taking one of these uh, airspeed Oxfords down from Scotland, stopping off at, uh, at Blackpool. And the leg from Blackpool down to its eventual destination, Oxford, uh, was against some appalling weather. Uh, so unfortunately, she decided to, uh, to make the trip, even though being counseled that the weather was not, uh, not suitable. Uh, she also um, it's believed flew above cloud, which was again prohibited by uh, ATA's uh, uh, general set of rules, and ended up uh, running out of fuel and ditching in the Thames estuary off of Hearn Bay. And this rather magnificent uh, life-size monument uh, to her was unveiled by Prince Michael of Kent in 2016. Uh, and the, the whole uh, memorial to her was really at the instigation of uh, Jane Priston and her uh, colleagues at the Amy Johnson project in Hearn Bay. And you may be interested to know that uh, Jane is, is going to give a talk uh, under the Maidenhead Heritage Centre's uh, banner. Um, in January next year, January the 6th, we we'll talk about uh, Amy's, uh, Amy's life. One of the recruits from uh, New Zealand was Jane, uh, sorry, June Howden, who was a particularly accomplished artist and depicted here is uh, uh, Spitfire number five, which was uh, used by ATA's training pool at, to, at uh, Tame and a good depiction of the sort of conditions that uh, pilots were faced with up in the Midlands where all the factories combined their, their smoke with an already hazardous British weather. So not the most ideal. Three third officers sitting on a Spitfire. Um, the, the lady with the scarf uh, is in fact, uh, another one of my interviewees uh, she went on to work for British South American Airways, uh, an emergent airline, uh, and wore her ATA uniform acting as a stewardess on approving flight down to Buenos Aires. Uh, she also went to work for Skyways as an air hostess and also a pilot because they got a contract to fly RAF surplus hurricanes and spitfires down to the Portuguese. The lady in the middle enjoyed as a child with her brothers 
um, a hand-me-down five pounds, I think it cost, uh, a redundant sock with World War I uh, biplane uh, was planted in the back garden for the kids to play with. Wonderful. Monique also after ATA went on to a commercial uh, career and in fact operated uh, joy rides out of London airport as it was in those days. Now, of course, Heathrow. The lady on the right is wearing uh, America uh, shoulder flashes, but in fact uh, became British on, on, on marriage. Two sisters joined ATA completely ab initio, and neither of them could uh, drive a car at the time. Uh, the lady on, they, they both in fact became um, uh, our interviewees, but the lady on the right, Joy Lofthouse, if you've ever seen a documentary about ATA, you will have seen Joy, because in her later years, she was one of our greatest ambassadors. Lovely lady. Two more uh, for the Foreign Legion of the Air, this time uh, from the, the, uh, the ladies. Uh, Anna Leska was in fact uh, a pilot in the Polish Air Force, uh, very bitter about uh, what the Germans were doing. She managed to escape from, from uh, her homeland uh, as the Germans invaded. Uh, managed to join ATA eventually, and although her English was a little restricted, um, she apparently used to uh, uh, argue the finer points of it with another recruit, uh, this one from Chile, Margot de Halda, who, because people couldn't pronounce de Halda, uh, just called her Chile when she was in ATA. So the two of them, both at Hamble Ferry Pool, used to argue about uh, the, the finer points of English. The lady on the right, Jackie Mogridge, uh, came up from South Africa. Her parents allowed her to uh, uh, come to Britain. I'm sure she pestered them uh, uh, in order to let her do that. Um, and she got into ATA, uh, quite successful in ATA. And after the war, she joined the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve and was one of the first ladies to actually get her RAF wings. And she is actually pictured here in the cockpit of a meteor jet. She was rather miffed at not being allowed to be the first woman to fly supersonic, uh, an honor that unfortunately her namesake, Jackie uh, from the USA, uh, beat her to it, but there we are. Another of the uh, uh, interviews, this lady was in fact one of 17 very lucky WAFs who actually got uh, clearance to uh, uh, join ATA and ATA taught them to fly. And she now record, records her experiences of uh, coming to grief in a swordfish uh, torpedo bomber. Talking of, of, of memories, um, uh, we understand from Katie Smith, now Hirsch, that um, you may have some stories to tell us about uh, uh, a swordfish adventure uh, yes, at indeed. Turnbury. <laughs> that was absurd. Um, I made an awful mess of a forced landing on what is now the Long Ninth Hole at Turnbury, which was very near the airfield. And it was right on me, near the airfield, and I was expecting the ambulance, which came, and the fire engine, which came, but not first. The first thing that happened was a little grey Austin with the station engineer officer, and he rushed up to me and he said, where's the Form 700? And after quite a long gap, and are you all right? <laughs> So then they took me up to sick quarters in an ambulance and they gave me the very modern treatment for crash pilots, namely two aspirins and a glass, a cup of tea, or it may even have been one aspirin and two cups of tea, but anyway, that was the treatment I got. 
Then a phone call came through from the control tower that the CO from Prestbrook had come to fetch me. And um, did I feel all right about flying back? And I said yes. Just to, to continue that, um, that saga, she then got back to her base uh, at, at Tame by train overnight, went to see the local uh, uh, pool doctor who said, uh, take a couple of buses to, uh, uh, to Halton where they've got an x-ray machine because I think you may have cracked your skull. So the treatment uh, that she got there. This is uh, a little story. Johnny Jordan was one of ATA's rogue pilots uh, who leading two other aircraft up the River Severn, decided to fly under the Sharpness Railway Bridge, got through okay, so did his male counterpart. And Anne Wood from the USA, anything the boys can do, I can do. She got through flying the same route a few days later uh, on her own decided to try it again, um, but a very lucky lady because uh, because of the tidal rise on the River Severn, the gap was much, much narrower than when she first went under, but she got away with it. No one reported them either. Now, we're going to take you through uh, a busy day for Letis Curtis. This is quite amazing. You can imagine the number of uh, ferry uh, chits that she would have collected for this day. We start with being a passenger across to Brooklyn's in an Anson. She then takes a Wellington up to Little Rissington. From there, collects a Spitfire and takes it to Clandau, and then across by road to St. Athen, where she collects a mosquito and takes it down to Ford on the south coast. Then she's passengered back to Brooklyn's, and here we go round again. Another Wellington up to Little Rissington. Another Spitfire to Flandau, across by road to St. Athen. This time, a Mosquito down to Ford and a Mustang to Litchfield. And then across to Castle Bromwich in a Puss Moth. And finally, getting home in a Wellington. And she was away from her home base for less than an eight hour day. In fact, she was flying for four hours, five minutes and on the ground for three hours, 15, seven hours, 20 in total. She went on to uh, fly post-war, loved racing, used this WICO aircraft, which in fact was designed by uh, an ATA uh, first officer from uh, uh, from Australia and if you've seen the NHS Spitfire flying around uh, the UK this year um, that too has ATA connections because it was gifted to the American uh, air attache post-war and he nominated uh, Lettuce to fly it on his behalf in air races. Uh, his assistant was also uh, was was uh, also an ATA first officer, the lady who made it under the Sharp Mess Bridge, Anne Wood, was the assistant to the American Civil Air Attaché. Lovely story. Uh, I know I'm taking time, but a uh, lovely story. The commanding officer at uh, Ratcliffe was Frankie Francis, and he and his wife had set up a Christmas party, hoping that uh, the, the uh, air crew would uh, come and, and join them. But the vast number of these uh, uh, crew were out on a busy day. And having been collected in the, for the taxi Anson, making their way back as a dreadful day had been, and the, the night is, is drawing in, they couldn't identify their home base, but they thought we've got to get this down. So they actually managed to put it down in a field which was suitably close to where uh, Frankie Francis lived. But they had a great time in the party, much to his surprise, because he didn't think they'd get back. 
And when they came to look at the aircraft uh, in the next on the next day, they realized that they're not going to get it out of this fair, airfield. They might have landed it in it, but uh, no way would it take off. So Frankie spoke to his neighboring farmer uh, and said, I say, could we possibly take down the hedge between your two fields so that we've got a long enough run? Farmer wasn't too keen on this idea to start with, but Frankie was a millionaire and he offered to buy the two fields. Uh, so the farmer thought this might be quite a good uh, idea. So they did actually take down the hedge the fence and got the aircraft out. And Frankie actually flew it out. Uh, and luckily, officialdom didn't seem to hear about it, but uh, they got away with it. And although the farmer had agreed the sale, um, he, he didn't hold Frankie to that. And all he required was uh, a bit of repair on the field and the hedge. Didn't always go well, as we know, with ATA. This was a training flight for which uh, the American flight captain, Ben Warren, got a commendation, commander's commendation, for uh, managing to get his trainee, First Officer Jane Plant, out of this aircraft, uh, smoke in the cockpit, engine fire. And unfortunately, Jane Plant wasn't really designed for being forced through uh, escape hatches. So uh, uh, he made it anyway and managed to get out himself, got accommodation for it. Just a few uh, facts, 309,000 uh, aircraft ferried. As you can see from the examples of ferry records, Lettuce Curtis topped it with uh, 1,467 aircraft moved, but the two gentlemen with, uh, uh, without an arm, uh, Stuart Keith Jopp, 1,300, and Charles Dutton, 838. Come September 45, they held uh, They held a pageant at uh, White Waltham, and just to show the, the public the type of aircraft they've been uh, flying, put on a bit of an air display, and the White Liberator in the picture here was actually flown in by Lettuce Curtis. So the flag was finally drawn down on ATA on this day in 1945 by Audrey Sale Barker. And in fact, behind my head in the picture there is um, a facsimile of that very flag that was displayed at the last, uh, at uh, the ferry pools up and down the country. The veterans badge was very sadly not awarded until 2008. And Although most of the recipients in a very uh, uh, flash uh, ceremony up at number 10 Downing Street after a display at White Waltham, the recipients were largely those who had been air crew. And although the ground crew were perfectly entitled to receive this badge, I've been very privileged to have found a few and actually presented one of these badges to them or their family uh, on behalf of the Department for Transport. There are several memorials to ATA, three of them here, one at White Waltham behind the clubhouse, one in the crypt at St Paul's, and the most magnificent one at Hamble with that uh, model of a Spitfire atop it. And this morning, one of our ATA Association members, Christopher Hobbs, went to that memorial in White Waltham and laid a little floral uh, tribute and uh, some words in memory of uh, uh, the ATA on this special occasion. The only American female pilot to lose her life when flying for ATA was Mary Webb Nicholson. Uh, came to grief when the propeller separated from the Miles Master she was flying and the aircraft crashed into a farm building uh, on the 22nd of May 43 
And 76 years after that, we, uh, I was privileged to jointly unveil the memorial here on the site. There are several tributes uh, to ETA's aircrew around the country. We've known a number of new road uh, namings recently, new estates. But over in, uh, in, in Spain, Barcelona, there are two roads, one named after uh, the, the gentleman I've already talked about, Jose Maria Carreras, and his uh, wife, Mary Pepa, who was also a very experienced pilot and the two roads intersect in the airport. Molly Rose, First Officer Molly Rose, uh, donated a trophy for inter-service women's rugby. Uh, the, uh, one of the trains in the Great Western Region uh, was named uh, both after Johnny Johnson from the uh, Dam Busters and Joy Lofthouse. Uh, then Mary Ellis on the Isle of Wight had a, she was um, a free, freeman of the island and had a school building named after her and a fleet of eight buses in Hatfield were named after each of the eight original lady uh, recruits in ATA. The last occasion that we managed to get representative group of veterans together was back in 2017 when these five, the gentleman standing with a stick was uh, an ETC cadet, the lady with the handbag was a secretary, the two ladies uh, to her right are Joy Lofthouse and Mary Ellis, two pilots. On the arm of the chair is Ivan Flynn, uh, ground engineer fitter, and behind him the son of Chief Operations Officer, and it's uh, Derek Smith, who's our standard bearer. And so, um, as we have already seen, Jay uh, Edwards from Canada, she is one of only four surviving, to our knowledge, surviving uh, members of ATA's air crew. Uh, Nancy Stratford over in uh, California, Eleanor Wadsworth uh, in East Anglia, and uh, the, the last man standing, uh, Sir Gerard Peat, uh, also in the UK. And although we've got Jay with us tonight, the other three all know about this. In fact, um, they may well even be watching. So uh, uh, we, we wish them all well, all centenarians. Uh, Gerard, uh, Sir Gerard Peat uh, was 100 this year. I'd like to finish by saying a few, uh, this is uh, a little uh, verse that I put together. A time in which we've said farewell to those who did so well as tell of times in years that we had never known like them when altogether in ATA they played a part that left us all a thankful start to a life in which we now must show that to them thanks we will bestow and strive to make all new aware of what they did that was so rare, we will remember them. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for that, John. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we do have the opportunity for Q&A. Uh, John will be happy to take some of your questions. I see a few people have been chatting away in the chat box, um, but we'd love to hear from some of you. If you'd like to raise your hand using the uh, raise hand button at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen, at the top of my list, I already see a number of hands up. So um, we'll go first to Roz Davies. So hello, I believe that um, the ATA had one of the highest uh, mortality rates of all the services, is this true? This is one of the things that it, it's statistically it, it is true if you if you compare uh, the, the proportion of people employed by ATA and the proportion of people in the services. Yes, that is true. Thank you, John. I see next up Stuart, Stuart McDowell. Hello. First, congratulations on an excellent presentation and thank you. I'm calling from Dayton, Ohio. 
I'm the namesake of, of Joseph Stuart Wiley. My name is Stuart. Uh, he was an American who was lost over the Irish Sea on December 10th, 1941. Having been, having been a survivor in the Narissa, one of the first Canadian transport ships that was sunk by a U-boat um, in the previous year trying to get to England to, to help with the campaign. And my question is, is there a list of those who perished in sequence and uh, until I, so I know about when, you know, in the, in the long line of those who perished were flying for the ATA, um, when, um, uh, when, he, um, when he did die on December 10th, 1941? Um, we, we, we certainly do have a, a pretty comprehensive list of um, uh, ATA's casualties and um, uh, when and in what aircraft and so on, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate your presentation. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, next up, we have Howard. Howard Cook. Good evening. Excellent presentation. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, this is more of a statement than, uh, than a question. It's, uh, I was speaking to Eleanor Wadsworth a couple of days ago. Third officer, Eleanor Fish, W122. Eleanor is 103 now. And she's a bit rough running at the moment. So we spoke a couple of days ago, but on her behalf, I wanted to pass on our best to everyone tonight and to Jay and Nancy, et cetera. So, um, uh, but if you could just please uh, accept her uh, hello. And uh, she looks forward to seeing the footage that's been shot tonight um, on her TV back at home. I'm really pleased to hear that. Uh, I, I intermittently, um, uh, in contact with uh, Eleanor, so uh, yes, and and um, she featured a lovely interview that was uh, translated into uh, uh, an article for a local uh, one of our uh, aviation magazines uh, recently. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's a lovely story because she started out as uh, an architect working uh, at. at uh, uh, White Waltham on the, the new building and uh, was asked if she'd like to learn to fly. So yep, she was great. first of the first of the ground entries. I wrote a couple of articles in Fly Past and in Pilot Magazine about her and also for the Shuttleworth Magazine and we took the Shuttleworth Magis that Magister to go and give her a buzz as well because she learns on Maggie's. Very good. So, and I'm in very regular contact with her but I pass on her best and thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Howard. Uh, next up, I see Air Commodore Betridge. I've opened your line, sir. Um, hello, um, John. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, I didn't have a question, so I, I wasn't quite sure I was unmuted, but I, I very much enjoyed your talk. Uh, and uh, I thought that it was uh, a really good um, uh, uh, investigation into the different characters. Uh, the, the huge range of different characters who uh, contributed so splendidly uh, to uh, the ATA's um, absolutely vital work uh, during the war. So um, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And uh, all I can say that uh, uh, as a serving RAF officer is that um, uh, our, our attitude to um, the inclusion of, of women in particular uh, in all our roles today uh, has significantly transformed uh, from the time of the Second World War. So uh, we now have all our roles in the service are uh, open to uh, women uh, across the board. So there's been a huge change uh, since, since those days. But I, I thought your talk was absolutely fascinating uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. I, I only, my great regret is that I didn't meet more. I, I, I got to know a, a number of the, the veterans, um, uh, but I, I got involved in this uh, rather too late to meet some of the real characters. But um, uh, we had some, some great time with, uh, with those that I did meet. Thank you. Uh, next up, I see Graham Rose. Graham, your line is open if you'd like to unmute. Hello, John. Well done. This is Graham Rose. I just wanted to uh, make, I think, a point, John, and that is that um, my mother always used to refer to a livery 
rather than a uniform. As she always used to say, a uniform perhaps you could keep, but a livery I had to return to stores. So she never kept her livery. That's Molly, first officer Molly Rose. Uh, the other thing I would, would just remark on is if anybody is uh, happening to be passing by RAF Bryce Norton, you'd need to actually get into the perimeter. There's a lovely memorial plaque for my late mother and, and the wonderful Mary Alice. Yeah, very good, uh, very good, Graham. I, sh I should have remembered your uh, uh, your, <laughs> your mother's uh, attitude. I, I should have I should have uh, amended my talk accordingly. Yes, <laughs> I remember Molly only too well. In fact, if it wasn't uh, for her, I would not now be secretary of the association. So thank you, Molly. Plenty more hands up. Let's go to uh, John Eames. Peterson. John, your line is open. Yes, thank you for a, a, a lovely talk. Um, this is John's wife, Margaret Eames Peterson, and I'm now Mayor of Hatfield, and we're doing paintings and murals in the underpasses of Hatfield, partly to remember de Havilland, because the British Aerospace uh, site is now no longer there, but we are remembering our heritage in the aircraft. But we would also like to remember the ATA pilots I need to say that um, uh, Jay Edwards is um, is my husband's aunt as well. So it was lovely to see her to, tonight. And we went over for her 100th birthday two years ago. But it, just remembering her not only through the UNO buses, but we could try to, if you could send us a list of the ATA pilots that were ever in Hatfield, I could then try to remember them and have their picture in the underpasses. Okay, um, one of the great regrets that we have is that although we have very comprehensive staff listing, we don't have uh, a, an overall list of where people were actually stationed. Um, so although we can pick up uh, a number of these facts from uh, miscellaneous records, we don't have a, a, a dedicated list of such things. That's something I've always regretted really in knowing where, where people were actually stationed. But um, we could make a stab at it if you, uh, if you, contact, um, if you contact us. Um, we, we'll certainly uh, see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much. Right, let's see, still plenty of hands if you don't mind taking a few more questions. Uh, I have Jennifer Knightsbridge. Jennifer, can you hear us? My grandmother was in the ATA and uh, as a result of my being informed, I think, from making inquiries of Terry Mace, I've got my brother to join this evening as well and also one of my cousins. Um, now, she joined very early on, I think, in the 1930s. And I understand her contract wasn't renewed because of damage to air. Well, it's a shame we seem to have lost uh, that lady. Um, John, any final thoughts from you? We don't really have much time left for any more questions anyway. Understood. Yes, a great pity because um, uh, she sounded quite interesting with the uh, uh, possibility of a uh, another connection to a, an ATA veteran. Um, I think in closing, I would just like to add that uh, uh, if anyone has any further questions or would like to get in touch with, with us at the uh, ATA Association or at the Maidenhead Heritage Centre, I'm sure that um, uh, details of contacts uh, can be supplied, but uh, uh, I've enjoyed this evening. It's it's been uh, great fun. Uh, I hope you have too. And uh, I think it's time to uh, uh, hand over to Sir Michael and uh, give a toast to the ATA. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it, it's been a, a wonderful evening. There have been some wonderful moments. Um, of course, we started with Mrs. J. Edwards and how very special that was. And then all the stories that John regaled us with. I think the standout moment for me, the one that characterized so well the spirit of the ATA men and women was that day 
when Lettuce Curtis got into something like seven or eight different types of aircraft and flew all over the country. One of them was a mosquito, and anybody who knows anything about aircraft in World War II will know mosquito was quite a handful, all taken in her stride. Quite, quite amazing. So it's time to thank people. Firstly, Minnie Churchill and John Webster from the ATA Association, who've given us a wonderful evening, as I've said. Thank you both. Then to the English Speaking Union for its support, Anthony, Anthony Harris and Rachel Fernandez, who've done an awful lot of work behind the scenes and given us the opportunity to come together. To my deputy chairman, who worked so hard on behalf of the branch in Lincolnshire, Camilla Carbon Flynn. Thank you very much, Camilla. We do rely on you so much and you always give so much to us. And then to you all from near and wide who've watched this evening, asked questions and clearly enjoyed it. Next year, we hope to commemorate another special ATA occasion. And I think Mike McKenzie will be getting in touch with you. Uh, and I know the RF is very keen to be involved with this. And just mentioning Mike McKenzie, he is the man who has done so much to bring us all together for this evening. Thank you, Mike. It's been a great pleasure for the ESU to do this. Indeed, it's been a privilege. The knowledge that so many relatives and friends of those who flew with the ATA are with us tonight makes me feel good. It's been a very special evening, and I think to have brought this family together on this occasion is really very, very special. It is, as we said, the 75th anniversary of the day that the ATA was disbanded at White Waltham. You've heard a lot about its achievements, and there are many. But I suspect what will be uppermost in everybody's mind will be the bravery, the commitment, the skill, and the resilience of those men and women who provided such a magnificent service to the free world from 1940 to 1945. So I hope you've all got a glass ready to drink a toast to them because they certainly deserve it. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, the toast is to the Air Transport Auxiliary. The Air Transport Auxiliary. Thank you all and good night. <laughs>